Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. I am Rhonda Geek, Director of Marketing at Shapeways, and I am happy to present a, another webinar to you, this time um, with Mamaki. We did one previously with Josh and Steve from Shapeways. Um, Josh has so graciously decided to return and help us with this webinar, and he brought one of his team members, Jaime, with him. Uh, so we are so excited to have you here today. A little about Shapeways, in case you didn't know, Shapeways has two locations in Europe and the US. We have printed over 20 million parts to a million customers in 160 countries. And we focus both on 3D printing and traditional manufacturing. If you want to know more, please visit shapeways.com so that you can see all that we offer. One of the things that we do offer is 90 materials and finishings. And Mamaki is part of that offering. And we're so excited to partner with Mamaki on an everyday basis and also for this webinar. So let me introduce everyone. I am going to be moderating. I will be taking your questions over in the chat. So please, as soon as you have questions, feel free to add them into the chat and I will filter them. If we can't get to them, I will have someone on my team follow up with you and answer the questions. Sometimes we get questions that are a little uh, too robust for the webinar. So we take those offline. I have Josh Hope, who's the Senior Manager of Digital Imaging and Innovation at Mimaki, and Jaime Martinez, which is a 3D Applications Specialist, who is going to take us through a technical webinar talking about how to design for 3D printing in full color. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Josh so he can tell you a little about Mimaki. Thanks, Rhonda. Yeah, so so Momaki, uh, we're super excited to to partner with Shapeways. Um, Shapeways has been using uh, the 3D UJ553, which is our largest uh, industrial uh, full color 3D printer, uh, for uh, I guess going on two years now, something like that. Um, so so it's been a, it's been a really exciting partnership, um, and and we really value uh, what. Shapeways is able to do to be able to, to bring uh, the output of these exciting machines uh, to uh, a really wide marketplace, right? Um, but one of the things that we found and that, that Rhonda has heard and that certainly that we have heard is that there's a lot of questions around um, how, to, how to prepare files or how do we get the most out of uh, the potential that these, that these machines have. Um, and so that's why we decided to put this presentation together. And by we, I mean 99% Jaime Martinez put this together. He's put a ton of work into it. Um, Jaime is, is really our, our, uh, my, my right-hand guy, and he knows all things uh, uh, about 3D. And, and I know that he's really excited to, uh, to get this rolling and, and to share um, tips and tricks and things that he's found uh, over the last few years. Um, so just to mention the 3D UJ553, we released this machine back in 2018. Um, and then last year we released the 3D UJ2207. So this is a smaller version. The 553 is our industrial machine, um, really designed for companies like Shapeways, people that, that are doing uh, you know, high volume um, and need that big 20 inch by 20 inch by 12 inch build area. Uh, the 3D UJ2207 is a smaller, uh, bench top machine. Uh, it's got a build area of eight inches by eight inches by three inches, but it's able to give us the same kind of quality uh, that the 553 can do um, just at a, at a smaller footprint and a smaller price. So as we go through this presentation, um, all of the printed samples that, that you'll see that Jaime is showing um, all came from, from these machines. So I just want to give a brief overview of those. Um, if you have more questions about the machines or more questions about um, things that Jaime's talking about that, that we can't get to in depth in this presentation. Uh, please, as Rhonda said, uh, reach out to Shapeways or reach out to Momaki USA, uh, and we're super happy to, to help in any way that we can. And having said that, I think we're ready for Jaime to jump in and, uh, oh, 
or I guess Jaime's going to go through the, the presentation and what he's going to go through, and then he'll <laughs> so turn it over to you, Jaime. All right. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Okay, so uh, I'm kind of nervous to be here today, as usual. But um, yeah, I really want to. I really like to share um, mm, uh, all the knowledge that have been, you know, um, accumulated over the years. Um, part of my part of my job is is definitely make customers to understand uh, the technology. Um, I try to have a holistic approach to it. You know, what are the advantages, uh, disadvantages? Um, you know, because there is always uh, uh, limitations. As, uh, because you know that happens in in pretty much every um, every type of manufacturing uh, segment, you know whether it's 3D printing or traditional uh, manufacturing. And uh, well, in here is is basically you know just kind of bridge that gap between uh, color printing and 3D printing. So on one hand, you ha you would have people who do um, regular 3D printing with uh, just a single material. And on the other hand, you have uh, impressive, uh, you know, graphic designers, people who who do digital sculpting. They uh, they might be kind of new, uh, you know, to to three D printing, or they have have absolutely no idea on 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 what it is. So I try to bridge that gap, um, especially with our product, um, because uh, we definitely uh, um, can be in that part of the market, that, you know, just developing uh, color prototypes. Uh, so um, we're gonna go with the basics. Uh, so it's gonna be for um, you know some of the people who are maybe we have some newcomers. So I'm just gonna go uh, very quickly on the on the basics. Uh, the most important one is uh, talk, talking about uh, clean mesh uh, geometry. You know, have uh, understand the the principles of, uh, of designing, and um, and from there uh, we can just you know go into uh, uh, our subjects. Uh, understanding our technology, but at the same time, uh, a lot of this is gonna uh, can be applied to to your own uh, technology. So if you do FDM, um, SLA, you can take uh, some of these tips uh, and tricks uh, in the basics. Then we're gonna move into uh, uh, texture-based uh, workflows, and this is very important because uh, working with textures is so much is so much easier. Um, especially when, when you have high definition color. So there is two ways to, to do texturing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, there is two ways to apply color in a 3D mesh. So one is texturing, and the other one is uh, using vertex color, which is applying the color directly into the mesh. But uh, that one has a couple of limitations. We're gonna, we're gonna see uh, a little bit of, uh, about that. Okay, so, uh, so let's go with the, um, on the importance of the clean uh, mesh geometry. So we're gonna go with some uh, basics here. And uh, yeah, you can see. Uh, so, you know, so first of all, uh, for, you know, for all the uh, new users or people who are uh, new to uh, thread printing. So the best way to, um, <clears throat> I guess, to, to go with 3D printing and 3D design in general is to uh, know uh, your modeling tools. Um, Every software has, you know, advantages, disadvantages, but we all have the same. We we can use the same principles for designing and also to uh, to manipulate uh, the mesh. <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna switch over here. Uh, so uh, to Blender, let me go back here, share, and select the window. Okay. So now we have. Um, so in here we have the uh, the Blender um, application. So uh, I choose Blender for um, for two reasons. One, it's a free software, open source software, and the second reason is because it can do. Uh, I mean, it, it can do pretty much everything in just one uh, platform. Um, I'm gonna be also showing a little bit of uh, Substance Painter. So um, today we're gonna basically turn this uh, really basic mesh here into. Uh, a couple of uh, pieces, working pieces. Now you can see all this volume, and all of this is using uh, texture-based uh, workflow. So uh, there is not uh, manual sculpting, and to be honest, I'm not really a uh, really good sculptor. I have very basic knowledge uh, on all of this, but you can still uh, can add detail and create uh, really cool stuff um, uh, with texture-based uh, workflows. So <clears throat> coming back into uh, into the basics, so. We have 
uh, first of all, primitives. So this is our, uh, these are um, uh, this is a, a, an example of, of a, a different mesh. And you have basic shapes that you can use uh, to design. So most of the users must be able to know, you know, just to be able to identify how to move um, your mesh. So in this case, I'm using every axis here. Also understand the, uh, you know, how, how to extrude the face. So it's basically, you know, select the surface here and use the extruding uh, tool. So in this case, uh, I'm gonna use the, the hotkey, which is E uh, in Blender, and I can extrude, and I can create a cube in here. Also how to select, uh, you know, different edges and faces. So I'm gonna move into this guy here, and I can select a single, a single face in here, or also select a loop. So if I go into uh, the loop selection, so I can uh, select all this edge. And the other tool that designers must be aware of is uh, the scale tool. So basically I'm gonna use the scale tool just to modify certain aspects of my mesh. <clears throat> and so that, those are very important. Uh, the other thing is how to um, uh, identify some faces. So for example, I have this flat face in here. If I turn this into triangles, now you can see my geometry is not, I mean, I still have all the surface here, but I cannot do too many modifications. So it's gonna be hard. On the other hand, if I know how to um, work in here, so for example, I'm gonna insert this face here, I have a much cleaner geometry and I can actually select some, some of these uh, features and start modifying. So for example, I can create like a small tube or cube. And um, so understanding these principles, it's it's good because uh, you will have more control over your mesh and you will be able to modify and uh, adjust to your needs. So that's how that's how it goes, uh, you know, for uh, some of the um, basic tools. Uh, let's go back into the presentation. Uh, Rhonda, can you help me out with that? Yeah. Please. Okay. <clears throat> so those are um, very simple, super fast, and uh, and here's the reason why I'm I'm kind of going into you know how uh, know your motion uh, notion of modeling is because um, to be successful in pretty much any 3D project, regardless if it's 3D printing or designing, a clean mesh is easier to edit. And, and I'm gonna show you uh, a couple of uh, uh, the reason here. So on one side you see um, uh, the figure with a clean geometry and the other one, uh, it's got a triangle uh, geometry. So um, I'm gonna go back, switch back to Blender. So I'm gonna go back here. And I'm um, sorry, it takes uh, just a moment here. Okay, so I'm gonna... I'm gonna turn up this layer for a moment and I will go with the base mesh and triangle mesh. Okay, so if I go into edit mode uh, with these two guys here, oops, sorry, there you go. So this one has a really nice and clean geometry and this one is the same mesh, it's the same surface, uh, the same size, but all the geometry is in triangles. And the thing is, uh, it's really hard for me to to edit this um, and try to select some of the surfaces. So for example, if I want the center of this, I can just select uh, the whole loop, go into selection and get the inner region. So for example, I can, I can easily select uh, some of the surfaces here. Uh, this one has already some um, uh, UV maps into it. And I can just select, you know, the entire body here, or just the arm. And I cannot do uh, the same with this uh, triangle mesh. So here is, um, and I guess uh, the the best way to to work with this is definitely have a clean geometry. Some some designers actually, um, you know, download a file from let's say uh, Thingiverse, and they're gonna uh, encounter this kind of mesh. But but again, uh, I mean, you can still edit some stuff, but it, it becomes harder. 
so it's harder to to select your your edges or, or your faces and then uh, also you cannot uh, subdivide the mesh so for example if I go here and, and if I need more resolution or more faces so for example if I subdivide my I'm going to do a quick uh, subdivision here and I'll go with yeah I'm just going to apply a couple So I'm just going to go with two subdivisions. Oh, sorry. Have to go with this one here and apply. And now you can see I have more faces here. If I try to do the same subdivision on this mesh, for example, I have a bunch of faces here. And I'm going to add the modifier. And I'm going to do subdivision again. <clears throat> And my computer is going to hang up a little bit here. And the reason why is because I have too many triangles and too many shot up edges. So now the computer is actually hanging up a little bit, and that's also not good for your uh, workflow. Now you have too many faces, and your computer is going to, it's basically going too slow. Oh, oh. And, well, and this can happen when you have dirty geometry. Um, Basically, your computer is just going to hang up in there, and uh, yeah, you won't be able to. So I'm going to uh, go uh, one step back, otherwise our software is just going to crash. So um, I guess, um, do we have any questions on, on that <laughs> so far? Is there an easy way to clean up geometry if you download something? Wow. Well, that's that's a really good question. So, uh, to be honest, there is no, um, there's not a silver bullet when it comes to that. Uh, again, the best way to to actually deal with that is um, you get better at modeling. That'll be the best way. So there 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 are tools that you can use uh, to. So the process is called retopologize. So basically, you will start pretty much drawing over uh, your mesh. Um, but it's still, you still need those um, uh, modeling and editing skills to get the best result. So, so yeah, there there are automated tools. Some 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 tools can work well, but honestly, it really depends of also of your source mesh. So, for example, if you if you have a dirty mesh, um, yeah, it's it's really complicated. So, so yeah, I guess the best the best piece of advice is is get better at modeling. I know it's not the answer that people. Uh, you know, it's looking for because we are in, you know, in an in an era where everything is, you know, try to, I guess, getting automated. But again, that's that's still we still need human input in here. Is is because there there sometimes there is very specific um, purposes uh, for your three D mesh or or your three D printed part. So yeah, human input. I mean, humans are still relevant <laughs> when it comes to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, for Fusion 360 users, do you recommend the to build it the model in Fusion 360 and import it into Blender for texturing, or do you have another suggestion? Uh, I think it's possible um, because, but because again, if you if you design in Fusion 360, you also must um, must have a good notion of of have cleaning uh, clean um, surfaces as well. So most of the time, it's, you can, so for example, from Fusion, you can export into an FBX format, and you can um, separate uh, your surface and create your UV uh, layouts. I'm going to be explaining that um, a little bit uh, uh, in, in just a couple of minutes uh, on how to, how to manipulate those uh, surfaces into the UV map. But I mean, it is possible. Just make sure that, that your surfaces are clean as well. So I think that's, that's the that's kind of the best way to explain that, that you can easily identify your, your each surface. So you can select that in, in work in Blender or any, you know, any other software it doesn't have to be Blender. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to let you go on with the presentation. I think some of these questions are going to be answered on the next part. Yeah. And if not, okay. we will get back to you. Okay. Okay, sounds good. So uh, let's go into the next uh, topic. So I'm just gonna stop here and um, can I, yeah, ask you. There you go. So 
So, you know, long short story. So uh, the cleaner your mesh is, the easier it is to edit and the easier it is to, to come back and, you know, change a feature or uh, adapt it to, you know, to a new use as well, because sometimes you're going to have a mesh that is for rendering and then you will switch it for 3D printing. So, yeah, I mean, a clean mesh is super versatile. <clears throat> Uh, well, this part I already mentioned, you know, works better with uh, subdivisions. And again, the reason why is because uh, these faces are going to e uh, divide easily. Like the computer really likes, you know, clean geometry. Computers are lazy as well. They like the, you know, they just find the shortest uh, path to get uh, what you need. Okay. Uh, uh, so now this, this part goes um, into the specifics uh, of the machine. So basically, you know, uh, talking about uh, understanding the 3D printer uh, technology. So in our case, is this is uh, what is called a multi-material uh, jet, multi-material jetting, and uh, well, other people know it as fall jet, but that's how Stratasys <laughs> actually advertises this. Um, but yeah, it's multi-material, and also it's based on the inject uh, technology. So uh, we have a water-soluble support. It's got like a waxy consistency. Uh, to the material and you can dissolve in the water and every overhang is going to be uh, projected uh, to the bottom uh, because you need a flat surface for the ink to land on so you know so that's 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 mainly the principle um, the support material basically you don't really have to worry too much about you know cutting um, stuff so that's that's one advantage um, but uh, some certain geometries are going to be tricky uh, because you, you need to find the best orientation to uh, reduce the, the support material usage, you know, and cut down cost. Um, the best way to explain um, each part is um, uh, think about it as an um, M&M candy. So the center is uh, uh, white ink or clear ink as well. And just the top layer is the uh, CMYK part, which is which is the color. So it's, it's a very thin layer. So I'm going to show it to you. Uh, real quick in the, into the camera. So I have this really nice, you know, high definition color um, apart here. And just in the back, this is kind of like a slice. So I use this uh, mostly as, uh, as color proofs, just, you know, uh, do like a small part um, and just to test color on features. So, but you can see this is filler ink, this is completely solid. <clears throat> if you hollow um, your part, so make sure that, the, that you can remove your support material later so you need to get you know like drain plugs or perforations so you can actually carve out and make sure that the support comes out of the part <clears throat> and yeah and that way you can cut down cost but it's an extra step also for um for finishing so it really depends on the on the size and the scale of the part that you will you know decide from from hollowing or not <clears throat> uh, so the C axis resolution uh, for the layer thickness. So uh, we have uh, 19 micrometers, 22 micrometers uh, for high quality. Uh, we have 32 micrometers uh, for standard and we have 42 micrometers for high speed. Uh, the C axis resolution, uh, so there is a common misconception on, on, on talking about uh, the machine accuracy. Um, I'm gonna explain that in a minute, but this only affects how smooth is your surface. That's the only difference. Okay, so the, I mean, if you have a lower number, so your your surface is going to be smoother, but also you're increasing your printing time. And this is true for pretty much every machine in the market, regardless of the technology. Um, as long as you ha uh, have a slicer, uh, that's basically a reality. So lower number means uh, more time uh, in a smoother surface. And, uh, you know, um, a uh, thicker layer is going to be uh, uh, less time, and um, the surface is going to be a little bit rougher. In this case, 42 micrometers is not that bad, to be honest with you, um, and especially, uh, for example, at the scale that we print uh, with the 3DJ553. So we can print really big stuff, and at 42 micrometers, uh, the surface uh, looks looks oh, great. Yeah. The, the color quality but the, the, the color detail is separate from the layer thickness? Uh, well, I mean, we, we're gonna have, so in, um, yeah, specifically for our machine, it's, uh, yeah, you have, 
whenever you have a, a smooth surface, you also have kind of more passes to it, so your card is going to look a little bit more um, stronger. And uh, yeah, the, the finishing is going to be a little bit better. <clears throat> That's, uh, yeah, as compared to others. But the for example, the difference between 22 micrometers and 32 micrometers is definitely not that high. So, so yeah. I, yeah, I will say, I will say, I mean, you have a slightly better color, but not, not that much. Uh, going back into uh, the next topic. So now we are going to talk a very overlooked um, topic here for muscle designers. So machine accuracy. Um, this is one part that people actually tend to, I uh, know, to overlook and uh, the X axis and Y axis uh, resolution uh, for your um, for your machine accuracy. So uh, the, depending on the technology, depending on the printing material, um, and the printing conditions, that's going to affect uh, how accurate is your print. There is always a little bit of, of uh, shrinking or warping in uh, certain parts, and that happens in the x and y axis in uh, most of the printer. And people definitely and so whenever you're looking into into the accuracy of a machine, this is a this is a most important value as compared to the z-axis resolution. I think this is this is very important in interpreting if you're talking if you want to talk about accuracy. <clears throat> so, uh, so again, so this uh, this part actually, if I printed it, you know, uh, upside down like this, so the uh, our printer has a uses a roller when it's laying down uh, ink. So basically, it's gonna exert pressure on my part, and that can change. You know, it's gonna it's gonna either warp it or you know make it bigger. Or also, uh, the part can you know cool down and shrink a little bit, you know after the after the printing process. So every material in every printer has um, a scale factor. So basically, you know, in well, the the easiest way to explain it is the bigger you print, the higher is your tolerance. You know, the, the more uh, deformation or warping you're gonna have. Um, most of the times we're dealing with uh, you know mostly with plastics. So uh, temperatures are going to uh, either shrink or expand um, your material. So that's that's something to keep in mind. And uh, so th the bigger you print, the the more tolerance you must give to 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 your prints. That's kind of the, the easiest way to go about that scale factor. Also, uh, in our machine, obviously. Uh, so yeah, you can expect uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 millimeters, uh, uh, especially for these. Um, for these uh, pieces, so that's that's a value that the machine can do uh, consistently. So 0 0.1 being ideal printing conditions, and 0 0.3, you know, just having a little bit of variation, maybe the humidity or um, <clears throat> it's um, yeah, especially humidity affects a lot on 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 the uh, final accuracy of the machine. Uh, and our recommendation, obviously, is your printing environment. So um, it's it's uh, machines are not going to perform well. You know, in in a super cold environment. So, for example, if you have your 3D printer um, in a you know in a basement with no um, uh, insulation, so basically uh, you're gonna have a lot of issues uh, with your prints as well. It might be just you know very small, but maybe you're not you're not getting the you know the the, the best accuracy of the of the machine. This is the so I think yeah, that, that's very important to have uh, Shapeways take care of your printing for you because they have great quality. <laughs> Control. Everything's printed really, really well. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's definitely uh, something that printed uh, service bureaus <laughs> do. And uh, obviously, you know, when when you work, uh, you know, as the printer manufacturer, you you have like a you know a special like a special room or conditions, or, uh, you know, to to develop all these prints. Yeah. I mean, we have a question about the color being yep. applied to the outer shell. And how thick is that color layer, and can it be adjusted? Yes, good question. Uh, so yes, the the color is about a hundred microns by default. Uh, in, uh, in the software, you can actually change that uh, to up to four hundred micrometers. So if you want to do a little bit of sanding, or or um, you can actually get rid of the layers. Um, yeah, you can you can uh, I guess compensate uh, for that. <clears throat> Uh, obviously, if you the thicker your color layer, so uh, your minimal features as well 
uh, are going to be affected. So uh, that's something to keep uh, to keep in mind. I'm going to um, talk about that a little bit later on. But uh, yeah, that's 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 you know, 100 microns and up to 400 micrometers. Continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so for example, uh, so now you know now that we understand uh, you know that we need a good mesh, and uh, we understand you know how it works, how our machine works, and again you know also think about you know the other technologies that there are available. So we need to define the purpose. That's the most important thing to do when you start a 3D project is what is the purpose of your 3D printed part? So in this case, in this um, image, we have a, uh, this is an RC um, F1 car and uh, it's actually fully functional. And uh, this one was done in several pieces <clears throat> uh, in order to fit all the electronics and, and, and the suspension and all of that. So, it's very important to know, you know, what's going to happen to that. Is, is it going to be uh, a packaging prototype? So, so for example, if you have a package prototype here, and this one is one piece, but if I want to make it more interesting, I can have it in two pieces, where I have the, you know, the bottle and uh, and the cap, you know. So, you know, what is the purpose of that? So they both work, but you know, one is going to be a little bit more attractive than the other. So what is the purpose of, of that piece is, is super important. Again, so I have, if I have, you know, to move parts here. So for example, this is the suspension and printed and clear. And I have some hardware in here. <clears throat> so that's part of defining the purpose of uh, the print. Or in this case, you know, do we have a nice, a nice figure like this one? You know, it's just solid. There is nothing else particular about it. It's, it's just like a single piece with a base and, and that's it. So very important to to kind of think ahead, you know, what you will need to to develop that that three D printed part. Uh, and the other units, it's going to be related on what are your, uh, you know, if it's in inches, a millimeters, uh, meters, or centimeters. So most of the times, you can use um, either millimeters. <clears throat> um, uh, you're going to do millimeters or inches. So that's uh, the best. Uh, so you know, define that uh, also. And whenever you're sharing uh, or working with our people, you know, make sure that you guys have the same units, and uh, that's that's gonna help you out a lot. Uh, second, obviously, I'm talking about assemblies. And again, going back into, for example, this kind of project here, uh, uh, working with little parts, uh, they function better for packaging, uh, and they also work better for finishing. Finishing is so much easier. When you have assemblies, so regardless of our machine can print this uh, that um, that part in one piece, but it's better if you actually create an assembly because you will increase uh, decrease the the amount of material that you need to print, and also if you need to I mean if something fails you only print you know the part that that it failed and and you can move on with the rest of the production, so this is another thing to to keep in mind. And tolerance and clearance. So again, going back into the you know maximum the accuracy of your machine, it's always a good idea to test your parts uh, to make sure that everything is going to work. Uh, so in this case, I have uh, I was mentioning here this this was the uh, the body for a for a three D printed uh, guitar. So basically, we have all the uh, the body done in three D and everything else, uh, just you know with uh, regular pieces, and it was a functional. Uh, prototype. So making sure that everything uh, is going to fit and, and it's going to work properly. So uh, tolerances, make sure that, you know, uh, that is, again, con uh, retraction or or warping. So make sure that um, you stay uh, you stay uh, within your, your machine's values and, and capability as well. Try to go a little bit fast on this. Okay, so let's jump into um, UV unwrapping, which is um, <clears throat> the biggest thing. Uh, well, the biggest uh, subject here. Okay, so UV unwrapping is basically um, so we're gonna turn our uh, 3D mesh into into a flat version of, of itself, so we can project um, images on top of it. So um, the UV part is basically uh, that uh, we're gonna create a 2D space, and 
those coordinates u and v is going to be for horizontal, horizontal or and vertical. We cannot use x or y because we already have those coordinates assigned to our 3D model. So that's what you know uv stands for. It's just um, horizontal and vertical. So uh, let's go here and uh, let's go back to Blender. <clears throat> Alrighty. So coming back here, I'm uh, just going to hide this guy here. And uh, I'm going to be assigning some um, UV maps to this. So I have uh, separated this uh, mesh into three different uh, pieces. We have the base, we have the, uh, the body, we have the head. Um, I also need uh, to assign uh, turn this into flat. So basically what I what I have to do is just to select uh, one part of the mesh here and ask uh, the software to unwrap it. So there is um, every soft, every uh, software platform has uh, its own way, but it's, you know, it's the same principle. I'm just going to go into uh, the UV part of it and ask the software to unwrap uh, this little piece here. So if you look into into the right side of, of my screen, so you can see the unwrap piece, you know, has been turned into into a flat version of itself. If I go into a different place and select this part, so it's located here. Now going back to the body, we can select some of these surface here, and you can see this is the entire body. So uh, in order to do that, so this part that is, uh, uh, this red line here is actually uh, my seam. So this is where I'm asking the software, uh, go ahead and cut this. So I'm going to select this, uh, this part here, and in uh, uh, selection, uh, in edge, I'm going to ask him to mark a seam. So basically, I'm telling the software, cut here. Um, whenever I'm going to do the unwrapping process. So each geometry is different. So that's something that um, actually um, unwrapping properly comes with practice. And again, that's why it's important the notion of, of knowing how to model uh, just, to, just to be able to, to master this and, and, try to, and try to find the, the best way to do it. <clears throat> so again, always do it to your convenience. <clears throat> And, uh, and, and if there is already like pre-made uh, UVs in a, in a file, so I try not to touch them, just work with them. So um, I'm going to select here the arms. And you can see you can see all the surfaces in here. One thing that you can do in the 2D space is actually select one of the surfaces. And I can uh, also do scaling. And I can also move them. So I can rearrange this in a way that makes sense to me. Uh, for example, sometimes you don't really need uh, the bottom of the feet, for example, in here. So this, uh, I'm going to hide this for a moment. And I'm going to select this. So for ex oh, sorry. Yeah, selecting the bottom of it. Maybe I don't really need high definition color here. So I'm just going to uh, select it and, and scale it, you know, very tiny because I don't really need to, uh, to add some color. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Visible artifact when you print, or is that only for design? No, it's only so. This part is only for design. Um, and um, right now, all the all the I guess three D painting um, software tools that we have now, you can uh, paint seamlessly. So basically, when you go with your brush over uh, this surface in here, so you don't really see it. So that's one of the biggest advantage. Uh, uh, advantages right now of using, uh, you know, Substance Painter, Quixel, uh, Mixer. Um, oh, well, those are two that I have on the top of my head right now. Um, when it comes to or uh, to do, um, I don't know, three texturing, you can you can paint straight into into the mesh. So I'm gonna actually show this part. So yeah, I have this. So once I have my mesh and wrap in here, I'm just gonna move into uh, uh, for a moment into Substance Painter. 
And this is uh, how it looks once I have unwrapped my uh, mesh. So you can see the, the heading here, the two surfaces. And I added just uh, like a stone texture. I mean, we're it. not seeing that screen. Oh, oh sorry. As, as uh, can, you, me, can you also talk for a minute about file formats and the difference between the kind of color that maybe an STL file will carry as opposed to something like an OBJ? Uh, sure. Uh, so very quick on, until well, I'm just move here. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I thought it was going to be seamless linear. I'm going to have to do. <clears throat> okay. So uh, yeah, uh, the files format. So basically, uh, you will use uh, OBJ, um, VRML, PLY, and um, 3MF. Those are uh, all, all those formats um, can carry color. They also cover um, VRML and PLY and 3MF uh, can do also vertex color if you have to. Um, um, and that's basically it. Uh, when it comes to the mesh, the mesh is always going to end up in triangle anyway, uh, in triangles anyway. So, so yeah, that's uh, when it comes to to how the mesh is is looking. Uh, yeah, I mean it's basically an STL with extra uh, metadata. That's 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 what OBJ and all the other formats are. You have extra metadata for color. So so while so while say a, an STL can carry color data, it can't carry texture. Uh, a full you it can yeah that yeah. So basically, you can only do uh, a solid color, and that's. Uh, that's a mostly kind of recent feature of um, STL, but you can only do solid color, just one color. Um, if you need to do a high definition color, yeah, it must be uh, OBJ, VRML, PLY, and uh, 3MF. Okay, uh, so um, so here is my uh, base color. So very important here is um, when it comes to to the mesh is that we have the 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 machine really needs the base color. That's that's the most important part of. So all your color is gonna come from the base color. There are other maps for rendering, but the machine is basically going to ignore all of that. There is only one map that we can use to our advantage, which is the displacement map, which is a black and white image. So I'm gonna try to go back uh, here into Blender. Um, oh wow, this one is tricky. And uh, yeah, so going back here. So again, just uh, just part that I just showed up, you know, the the mesh unwrapped, and um, assigned material. So this one is, you know, I'm gonna define uh, how my my um, a section of the mesh or my entire mesh is gonna look like. So let's go with that assigned material real quick. Um, yeah. And uh, let me see if I can do screen two. It should be easier like this. There we go. And in this case, I'm going to do go into Blender. OK, so coming back into here. Uh, so in this case, I have uh, separated my mesh in three different materials. So specific for Blender, um, I'm just going to go into uh, the material uh, node in here. And I'm gonna create uh, a material. So I'm gonna make a new one real quick in here. Let me just select this, one. close it here. So right now it's you know just white, and I can just create a new material. And I can put a name for it. So uh, you know just put whatever um, you know it's it's good for you. So I'm just gonna do uh, add new. And in this case, I'm just gonna go here and assign it. So, for example, I can select the surface here. Oops, and I'm going to assign it. And now I can add for the rest of the surface. I can add a different material. So, for example, I can select a completely different surface here, and I can add a new one. So I have uh, some um, pre-made materials in here. So, for example, I can do. Um, I'm going to find headstone here, and I'm going to assign that to my mesh. And now you can see that uh, the software actually loaded up my, my previously made uh, uh, image. And if I go into my um, 
and the viewport here. So now you can see. So the part that I assigned with the, with the new material, it's, it's an empty material, so there is nothing here, but there is color on the other surface. So you can also do that uh, if you create you know, different textures and images. So you can do that, select a surface and assign a new material to it. <clears throat> okay, um, let's go back into, and uh, so I'm basically, I'm gonna go back here. So, and I have, you know, this uh, base material here is called body, but I can switch it to, uh, let's say, um, body, uh, body stone. And I'm gonna do the same for the base. So I already have all these, you know, pre-made uh, materials down here. So I'm gonna go into the base, uh, base stone here. And uh, one thing you can uh, see into this node, so on, on the basic material, we we won't have this image here, but now I have this. So this image was exported from uh, Substance Painter, and I'm gonna basically link it to my base color here. So that's how you uh, link that image to your uh, newly created material. So if I go back here, you can see that is now stone spray much everywhere. And I have also a pre-made uh, wooden material here. So this looks really nice, <clears throat> um, but also I need, you know, I want more detail. So I can actually use some of those maps here. Um, so let me go back here. And um, Rhonda, can you help me? Yeah. So again, important base color here. And um, yeah, we can add details using a black and white image. Um, that is uh, that is also um, known as as a displacement map. And basically, that uh, that black and white um, image is gonna is gonna lift or lower uh, your uh, mesh surface. So uh, you can use that to your advantage and, and actually add uh, some of the details uh, to your mesh. So I'm just gonna go uh, real quick in, in that. Just gonna go back here and screen two. Okay, so once I'm here, uh, so I'm gonna go back here into Substance, paint, substance Painter. Um, let's go with the head. So I'm gonna change my uh, material view uh, just to show uh, some of the detail uh, that I did to the head. So again, I use, I turned this uh, stone texture into a black and um, white image, and I also have my uh, height channel um, activated. If I deactivate it here, you can see that the mesh uh, turns flat. So I will export that um, black and white image in here. So the best way to preview this one is that. So that's the, that's the information that I'm gonna be using. So I will export this image and I will um, apply it to my mesh. So we're gonna um, go ahead and do that. So I'll go back into Blender. And so I already, you know, created some some of my, uh, you know, create my um, textures, I did my scale. So the thing that I have to do is um, to subdivide my mesh. Oops, there you go. And I'm gonna, use a modifier for that. So I'm gonna use a different subdivisions level. So this part is gonna be just rendering. So that means that the there is a calculation, but there is no changes in my base mesh yet. But in theory, I have more faces and more resolution. And the other modifier that I'm gonna be using, it's uh, the displacement modifier. So if uh, so, to add a modifier, it's basically you go here and multi-resolution here uh, for your mesh, and you can divide. Uh, so I did three sub subdivision levels because that's all the um, resolution that I need. And I can uh, and in here I will add as well the um, <clears throat> the displace um, mesh, uh, the displace mesh. Uh, sorry, modifier. And uh, my 
in here, I'm going to basically, you know, ask it to look for those that UV map. So very important that UV map must be ready. You know, you, you must be happy with your UV map. So in this case, I'm going to be using that UV information. And I'm going to activate it uh, uh, real quick. <clears throat> so the image that I'm going to be using is, you know, is the one that that I exported from uh, Substance Painter. I mean, a, a quick question, just a clarification. Uh, the question is being asked, yeah. is the height map, the black and white image in the stone image actually altering the, the texture of the image or is it purely affecting the paint color and not the physical depth of the sculpture? Uh, in this case, it's going to be um, altering the physical uh, depth of the uh, sculpture. So it's not, it's just going to stretch it or, you know, it's going to do some stretching to it. It's going to do a heavy lifting for, uh, for you. So the um, print at this point, show that that deep that physical detail in the print. Yes. Like, so I'm just going to activate it real quick in here, and I'm going to go back into material mode so people can see the change. So I'm going to de deactivate for a moment, and activate. And and I haven't touched any of the sculpting tools. Like that's that's exactly how it came out from. I mean there there was. Uh, and it was just a couple of clicks because I'm using um, a pre-made material in um, Substance Painter as well. So I basically haven't designed any of this. And, you know, it's just took a couple of clicks in here. <clears throat> so, yeah, at this point, this is just uh, a, a preview uh, render. So you can actually go back. So this is non-destructive to your mesh. So as long as you don't apply the effect, you can always go back and forth and test uh, different, uh, you know, changing the size of your map, uh, changing the size of your details as well. And you can also play with the strength of it. So if I go back here uh, at the bottom, so you can see, I can increase it or decrease it. So I'm just going to go with one millimeter. I'm oh, sorry, with one unit or uh, three units. And you can see how it's, you know, changing. Once I'm happy with, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the detail, so I can go ahead and apply um, those effects. So basically, if I activate this guy here, so I have uh, the body done, and also you can do uh, the base, and it's looking good. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, there is another thing that you can do, uh, in and this part is you know just to um, add detail, but you can also correct certain aspects of your mesh. So if I hide this guy here. And uh, now you can see, oh, let me hide this one real quick. There you go. Now you can see the base and there is a, a couple of, um, there is a couple of holes in here. So if I just try to uh, uh, do the displacement without uh, thinking about the base, so, so the figure is not going to stand up very well. So I basically created a mask in here. Uh, you know, so you can, you can always go back, for example, to, to Substance Painter and create a mask uh, for this. So I'll, I'm going to show it to you real quick in here. So I'm going to activate the base. And you can see the UV map, you know, to, to the right. And I'm going to activate those uh, materials uh, real quick. Maybe go into material mode. And uh, let's go with stone. And you can see and let me hide the body just for a second. And I have some um, mask in here. So if I hide this mask, so this part, uh, this displacement disappears. Just gonna go switch in here. And if I activate, so you can see this black part is where I don't want uh, uh, to have any kind of, um, I mean, black means uh, nothing moves uh, if it's white. So basically, you know, it, it's gonna be lifted up. So I can also create this real quick, just a couple clicks, uh, and modify you know the base without having to go and and sculpt the mesh. So you can activate and deactivate here. So I did it for for uh, for the for the feet, and I also did it for the bottom because I don't want I want this bottom part to be flat. Um, I'm have the feeling that we might have questions on this part. <laughs> We do have some questions, but I want to make sure that you get through the rest of the presentation. Uh, we have okay. about five minutes left. 
if we do not oh, get wow. to everyone's questions, we will follow up with you individually. So don't worry, okay. we will get back to you if your question did not get answered. Oh wow! Okay, we're gonna okay. So I'm gonna try to just go around real quick in here and then see if we can have a little bit of time for questions. So basically, I've done all uh, I have done all of these with uh, just textures and masking and images. So going back into my mesh, so I did that you know that masking so my uh, figure can stop uh, stand very well in here. <clears throat> and and once I'm happy here we go to the last part of um, my project. So I'm gonna apply all these modifiers, um, you know, because I'm, I'm happy with the, with the shape. Uh, so let me hide this real quick. And now we're gonna go to the last part, which is uh, decimation. And decimation basically is uh, turning the model, uh, reduce the amount of faces. So when I do uh, subdivisions and I apply the effect, uh, I'm gonna end up with a, with a super dense mesh. So for example, uh, I'm gonna take this space here. I haven't applied um, my multi-resolution, but I'm gonna do that. So it's gonna apply this. And if I go into edit mode, you can see there is a lot of faces, but also my geometry change. And you can see everything has been displaced, but that's actually what I'm, I'm looking for in this particular. But I have too many faces uh, and I can make this uh, a little bit better so I can go uh, with some decimation. So I'm going to select the uh, the shell that I need to decimate and I will apply this modifier. Um, a rule of thumb is uh, always go like 0 0.5, you know, just cut down the uh, the amount of triangles in half, in half and then you can still uh, start working from there. So I'm just going to apply this guy here if the computer lets me. Hey, oh, there you go. And I'm gonna apply it. So always keep in mind uh, to keep a balanced uh, number of faces. And how do you do that? Well, it's basically thinking about the scale of your print. So this particular print is, is about um, eight inches tall. So what I do is kind of silly, but what I do is if I actually see I put the the viewport in a, like a one one to one scale, you know, like if it was closer to the real life size. It, and if I can see the the detail, I'll keep it. If I don't see the detail, I just let it go. So you know, I keep um, decimating uh, the part. So I'm gonna go into edit mode, and you can see I have a bunch of uh, triangles as well. And at this point, I'm not too concerned. Um, with the mesh cleaning less because again, uh, this I'm already happy with my transformations and all that. So now the mesh can be whatever. So I'm gonna do it uh, once more. The decimation, uh, let's go with 0. Point, uh, just gonna go crazy with 0. 0.2. Oops, oh yeah, second moment, there you go. And I'm just gonna apply it. And now you can see there is less faces and I still have that nice, you know, the nice carvings. So, so if you really see it in context, I haven't lost too much detail uh, as opposed to the mesh that was uh, really dense. So you go as low as you can. So for example, this one, you know, has less faces. And um, the amount of detail, it really depends on your, um, also on your printer and, and again, the scale, you know, the size of the, of the real life print. So Jaime, I'm gonna jump in because we are almost at time and I, well, okay. I am sure that a lot of people have to go to their next meeting. I wanted to thank everyone for joining us. We do have a lot of great questions and I do promise that we will follow up with you and answer all of your questions. So please don't worry, we will get back to you on that. Jaime and Josh, I wanna thank you so much for joining us and taking us through this. It was so interesting and I think it really helps speak to the texture uh, needs mm -hmm. to design for 3D printing in full color. Thanks all. Yep, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically what you have to do. <laughs> and, uh, you can export from there. Yeah, so I mean, there is a couple uh, more things, but I mean, 
as long as you have a clean mesh, uh, if you inspect it in a 3D, let's say a 3D uh, printing tool, you know, for layouts uh, like NetFab or, or Materialize Magics or uh, yeah, all the other free. So if you have a clean mesh, so the the possibility that the mesh is perfect is is really high because you already have a you already started with a really good mesh. <clears throat> that is a great tip. Thank you again, everyone. Yeah. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And those that we did not answer to your questions, we will follow up. Thank you and have a great day, everyone. Thanks all. Thanks all. Thank you.